Let me also acknowledge my colleagues from DBE, the DG, and the head of exam, Dr. Polio. The deputy minister is in another province, so she's not able to join us. But let me thank members of the media most sincerely for a very helpful response at such short notice. So I present, I'm just going to open up, then allow the head of exams to give you a fuller report around the exams. But just to inform you that this morning we had to meet as MECs, we met at seven to reflect on a number of issues, in particular the focus on the leaked uh, maths paper on Monday. But in the morning we also received reports on the progress because the other matter with these exams was how we were handling COVID-19 uh, for exams. So we also received that report. And I think members of the media and the public will be aware that our reopening of schools was very difficult with very hard conditions that health has to come first. And that's why at all times we have to ensure that we monitor the sector in how it manages and responds to COVID-19. I want to start off by thanking our teachers and learners and parents for the resilience, but for the support and the hard work that was given to learners. As we had reported earlier, this year we presented in a, also a very difficult environment, the largest cohort because we had to combine the June and the December exams. So we have one, one million and fifty-eight thousand six hundred and ninety-nine learners who had to sit for this exam. They started off on the 5th of November, as we recalled that we started off much later, and they'll be finishing on the 15th of December, uh, 2020. And this exam, as I say, huge and big as it is with all the physical distancing, we are operating 8,200 exam centers in different provinces. We had to engage almost 80,000 invigilators to again help us manage the environment in total, we have 216 question papers that uh, that had, have to be written across different subjects, and we have printed more than 10 million script, uh, 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 exam papers or scripts for this exam. For markers, because again, it's a very huge exam, we have almost 45,000 markers who are going to be marking and they will be operating from 180 marking centers. And today, it's day 11 of the 30-day exams, and we are only a third away. So up to this far, only 83 papers have been written out of 216 papers. So as I say, it's really a third away from the, 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 the finishing line. So logistically, we had done all we could to make sure that we can manage the exams. Also in a very difficult area, there are lots of protests, there are also inclement weather, in inclement weather and all different uh, uh, challenges that we're facing them. Streets are blocked in Limpopo. Marking is going to start in January because we're only finishing on the 15th, then we have to do some cleaning up, mopping up. We will be announcing results on the 22nd of February in 2021. And for the first time, our schools will reopen before the metric results are out because we are opening uh, in the second week of, of, of January and the metric results will only be announced after we've already opened schools. And I really want to express my sincere appreciation and sacrifice and the hard work which was displayed by our officials at all systems in the system, uh, at all levels in the system both DBE, P, provincial education departments, districts, and circuits and schools in particular. And I really have to say 2020 academic year will go down as the most challenging, complex, and unpredictable uh, year. And amongst other things, I was really hoping that we were going to continue with the trend of no leaks, which we had maintained for the past two or three years. We've never had a leak. 
And I must say, sadly disappointed that indeed the paper that was lit on Monday is the paper. The other time we host papers, we each time we we we, we investigated, we found that uh, it's not the real paper. But the Monday one, we can confirm without any doubt that the paper was lit. And that's why we'll give you a, vor a very elaborate report about what we have done, what the processes are, because amongst other things we want to do is to make sure that we come out and be transparent and be honest, but also find a way of allaying the fears and anxieties of parents and learners around, especially the paper that had leaked out, explain what is going to be the process moving forward so that, again, learners and parents know what is going to happen. But in the meantime, also explain to you what steps we have taken now that we have confirmed that it is a paper that it is a real paper that has leaked and possibly even speak about the extent of the leak in the environment of ICTs where uh, it's much more easier. E earlier in the past, it used to be easier. Uh, you have to, you had to get a copy, but now if you are in a WhatsApp group, you can even move from Cape to Natal, it goes to Northern Cape and all sorts of things. So it's even much more difficult. So I say we are very disappointed that indeed only when we are a third away, a paper has been leaked and some learners, because some of the papers we got, the, the confirmation we got from learners, uh, the paper, and again, I think we'll explain how we got to know about the leak, what time we got to know about the leak and how we really also confirmed in different provinces uh, how the leak had surfaced there. So I really want to conclude by saying that the penalty for offenses relating to examinations are very serious and it really hurts me when adults put children in those difficult situations because our children are not printers, are not, they're not in the, in the, in the system but half the time they are the ones who suffer most. The learners who, especially when they were scribbling, cribbling, I still get letters from them, Dr. Polio, they've not been able to resolve their lives because the penalties are just too harsh for young people and we can't ease, because, ease those penalties because the integrity of the exam is very important. So that other learners who are very honest and who wrote the paper, we have to protect the integrity of the exam for everybody else. So for instance, Selena, you can be banned for, from writing exams for three years. And three years is a long time for a young person. By the time three years passes, they're completely disorientated. They've, they've, they've gone off the tracks. It's very serious uh, if you have been caught. There are some learners, one learner I'm told, uh, had brought scribble notes in an iPhone. So we have no doubt it's evidence that he had planned to really go and write. So which means already there's three years hanging on that child's head, which is very unfortunate, but we can't help it. But I want to thank you, DG, and the he head of exams for assisting us. But as I, as I say, this press uh, uh, conference is really around transparency, honesty, and protecting the integrity of the exams, because that's what we have to do. But thank you very much for coming. Thank you, Minister, and uh, good afternoon uh, to our Director General, uh, to members of the media. And uh, let me also indicate that I stand here this afternoon with a deep sense of disappointment in terms of uh, where we find ourselves. And uh, I think you and I are fully aware that uh, the metric examination is possibly the pinnacle of uh, our young learners' careers. Uh, it's the culmination of 13 years 
of learning. And uh, you would also agree with me that our learners, uh, the class of 2020, have gone through an extremely tough and tedious year in terms of the pandemic and the uncertainty and the disruptions that they had to endure. And uh, that which we promised our minister that we will do is to do the best to ensure that the metric examination does not add any element of stress to these learners who have gone through so much already. And I must say that as a system, we've done everything that was humanly possible to ensure that the 2020 examination uh, is successfully administered. But we've also come to realize that um, an examination system of the magnitude and size of the South African examination system will experience challenges from time to time. But uh, our DG tells us that uh, despite the challenges, the capacity and, and, and the responsiveness of the system to detect these challenges and to respond with the requisite speed and rigor will determine the examination credibility. So the point that I want to make is that despite the leakage of the maths paper two, that does not imply that the entire examination credibility has now been compromised. There are mechanisms in place to deal with the examination as a whole, and, and that's basically the thrust of my presentation. Now, our DG also mentions that you can plan and you can put systems and processes in place, but there's one aspect that you have no control over, or you do not have full control over, and that is the human element. And my assumption is it's the indiscretion of one official, uh, one staff member, that would have led to where we are uh, at the particular moment. Now, my first task is to just give you an update of uh, the examinations thus far. As mentioned by Minister, we've written 83 of the question papers, and, and that gives you the different question papers with the numbers and uh, you will see that we have some large numbers in certain papers like English FAR which is taken by almost 70 percent or more of our learners and we have a figure of 599,000 and and the figures that I represent here are in the main our full-time learners and it does not give you the full picture in terms of our part-time learners and our adult learners that have written this examination. As Minister has mentioned, this is day 11 and uh, we are positive and, and we're still uh, looking forward to the rest of the exam and we're confident that we will be able to ensure that the rest of the exam uh, goes without uh, major problems. Just to give you a sense of what are some of the issues that we experienced. Um, there were power outages during the writing of CAT and IT. And remember, CAT would be your computer applications technology, IT your information technology, and uh, we dependent on electricity. But given our relationship with ESCOM, uh, we were able to manage this and minimize the disruption. And where there were disruptions, candidates were moved to alternative venues and if there was lost time, they were compensated. And I can say that for these two subjects, all learners were able to complete uh, the examination in these two subjects. The other incidents that we've experienced thus far, which Minister has alluded to, we had protest action in, in Western Cape, uh, and that resulted in road closures. And as a result, a number of our learners uh, got to school but would possibly have got there a little late. Uh, and, and we had accommodated learners by making sure that even those learners 
that have come up to an hour after the commencement of the examination were allowed to write the exam. I can indicate that all schools were able to write the exam uh, in, in, in the Western Cape. What we are in the process of currently determining is whether all learners, and our assumption is that there may be a handful of learners that did not write the exam, but here again, we have a mechanism in place whereby those learners that have missed the exam on that date, which was due to no fault of their own, uh, will be able to write a, a second opportunity examination. Uh, we also had eight candidates at one of our centers who, instead of writing English FAL, first additional language, wrote the English home language uh, paper. Uh, this was unfortunate, but we also have a mechanism to deal with this particular problem. A wrong question paper was opened at one of our centers, but it was detected immediately, and we can confidently say that there was no compromise. Uh, one candidate walked out of the exam room uh, with the script, um, but here again, we have clear protocols in place to deal with. Uh, a phenomenon that we had previously, which seems to be resurfacing again, is what we refer to as imposters. Now, an imposter is sometimes referred to as a ghost candidate. Uh, technically, what happens in this situation is where one other individual or adult decides to write on behalf of the registered candidate. Uh, but in both cases, they were identified immediately on entry into the examination room because they have to produce their ID. In fact, one of them was apprehended and arrested by the police and the other one uh, managed to disappear and uh, but we've reported that to the police. Uh, we always have issues of learners not being correctly registered, particularly in the case of adult candidates who are not at school. And it's always quite difficult to be able to send them the preliminary registration data for checking. We don't allow cell phones in the exam room. And uh, there have been a few learners that have walked into the exam room with cell phone. Crib notes. Uh, there's been a significant reduction in crib notes, and, and that's a positive sign. Uh, some learners would have written the exam at a different center. Here again are adult learners. Because uh, they would not have received the information on time, they would have pitched up at a center which is not the designated center. But here again, we would allow the learners to write and make provision even though they were not registered at that center. For today, I think we're all aware of the uh, taxi strike. And uh, in the main, Kauteng, Depart Kauteng Department has uh, put a, a better plan in place. And uh, here again, we've allowed for late entry into the exam room for those that may struggle to get to their schools. Uh, we've also allowed for candidates that cannot make it to their designated centers to write at the nearest school and provision would be made uh, for an extra question paper. Uh, we also, through the prof jocks, have communicated to bus operators that are operating to ensure that if you see a learner in school uniform, that such learners should be picked up and taken to school. And we've had this experience before, and our bus operators have come to the party and have assisted us. I also think it's appropriate that we give you an update in terms of how we're managing uh, the COVID-19. And uh, remember, uh, we now have a clear protocol in place which says that learners that have a temperature of 38 degrees and above or any other COVID-related symptom will be allowed to write the exam, but they will write their examination in an isolation room away from the rest of the candidates and uh, there's a clear protocol in terms of how this examination is managed in the isolation venue. Um, in the case of candidates that have tested positive, uh, our minister and the director general have also taken the bold decision of allowing these candidates to write the examination. And we are working very closely 
with the Department of Health. We have a very good working relationship and uh, there are two options in terms of learners that test positive. Where there are quarantine centers, they will write the examinations at the quarantine site. If a quarantine site is not available or not close by, then together with the Department of Health and the school, together with the district, uh, we will then arrange a suitable venue uh, for the learner to write. And we've even gone to the point of indicating in our protocol that if you can't find a suitable venue and if the home is suitable, provided safe, provided it's secure, and provided it does not uh, have unnecessary disturbances, then learners could write in their homes, but under the strict invigilation of uh, an exam and a, a health official. Uh, just to give you a sense of what the numbers are in terms of candidates testing positive, uh, in most of our sessions, we've had between two to five learners per day. However, I thought it would be useful if I could give you the highest number that we've had thus far on the 12th of November. Uh, and, and the reason we would have had the highest number of 93 candidates testing positive because this was the day that we wrote maths and, and, and maths literacy, where almost 90% of the candidates would have written, and we had 93 candidates. Now, if you look at 93 candidates in comparison to the over 900,000 learners that would have written, then you would agree with me that this is a small number. We are closely monitoring our provinces where there seems to be uh, an increase, for example, Eastern Cape, uh, 53 uh, uh, learners tested positive, Free State, 23 learners. But I can confidently say that in provinces like Free State, learners are in their quarantine sites and, and this is being well managed. So these are just giving you a sense of what we picked up on, on, on the one day. Um, I also thought, uh, Minister, it would be useful to just share uh, a few of uh, incidents that just confirm the determination of our learners to write the exam. And, and uh, there are a number of these cases, but uh, we've just chosen three from one particular province. In the Francis Bard district, uh, a candidate was hospitalized, but insisted on writing the examination. The report says the candidate was weak and was given extra time. Candidate was able to complete the exam. In another incident, uh, a candidate got to the exam room, had an epileptic fit at 8.55, five minutes before the exam uh, is scheduled to commence. The learner recovered at three minutes past nine, insisted that um, she writes the exam, completed the exam was even offered extra time, but indicated that that was not necessary. Uh, in another case, also in the Northern Cape, candidate was admitted to hospital and uh, requested to write the examination in hospital. And that was arranged. And, and let me just say that the examination system is extremely um, accommodating. Uh, we even have learners writing in prison. Uh, if you are in a position to write, and if we can make sure that the environment is secure, examinations will be administered in these environments. Just to give you another example of sheer grit and determination, in Kaoting, a learner got to the examination room but had a severe bout of hemorrhoids. And this learner could not sit at his desk uh, in the examination room. But the, examin the learner insisted that he would write the exam. The learner was then moved to a separate room and the learner had to lie on his tummy and write the examination. So this is why I think the disappointment of our minister and director general together with our deputy minister are accentuated by the fact that here was a group subjected to possibly the most severe challenges of any year. but are so determined to write the exam and then we have this unfortunate incident which is possibly due just to one or a handful 
of mischievous uh, individuals that brings us to this particular point. I've just given you an example of some of the arrangements that we have in terms of managing COVID. Uh, in, in most cases, we have a, a health official at a district working in close uh, collaboration with our uh, education officials to manage uh, the examination. Uh, we have a very rigorous monitoring system with over a million learners writing at over 8,000 centers. <clears throat> we ensure as a minimum threshold that at least 70% of our centers are, are monitored. And in fact, some of our provinces have gone beyond the 70% to monitor almost 100% of the centers on, on a daily basis. Um, now let's come to this unfortunate incident of the leakage of the maths paper 2 and uh, minister requested that we provide you a chronological account of, of what happened on this the morning of the 16th of November uh, our chief of communications Mr. Mslanga at 137 on the morning of the 16th received this email uh, with the maths paper too. And it was the full maths paper. Uh, Mr. Mslanga then called me at about 7.20 that morning and uh, requested that I establish the veracity and, and the authenticity of this document and whether it was indeed the maths paper. By 7.45, we were able to confirm this, that this was indeed the maths paper and I must say that something within me sank. Uh, but nonetheless, we had to pluck up the courage and then deal with whatever needs to be dealt with. And by 7.50 that morning, Minister DG, Deputy Minister, and other senior officials were informed. Now, initially, we were under the impression that this was contained to possibly just a handful of learners. Uh, but at about 12.30, we then got a call from Limpopo, a call from Kauteng, to say that learners uh, were in possession of this WhatsApp. And then we realized that this was uh, larger than anticipated. And by 12.30, uh, we had released a media statement to inform the nation of this unfortunate occurrence. Um, we initially reported that it was localized to Lumpopo and Kauteng based on the information that was made available to us at that particular moment. Um, but however, uh, during the course of that day, uh, we were getting uh, you know, calls and messages that there were pockets of learners in, in different provinces. Uh, I can also say that in terms of the 137 uh, message received by Mr. Mklanga, this was a university student uh, in Johannesburg uh, who also runs an NGO that provides support to learners, received this question paper from four learners based in Kauteng, and he required or they requested support uh, from him to respond to certain questions in the paper. And when he received this, and uh, being the honest individual that he is, uh, realized that this was certainly the paper, and he refused to provide the support, and that's when he sent this through to Mr. Mslanga. Uh, now, I think an important point to mention here is that we're dealing with electronic mechanisms of transmission, which therefore means that where a WhatsApp surfaces, that does not mean that that is the origin or that is the source of the leak. So when we indicated that the leakage surfaced in Limpopo and Kauteng, it does not mean that the leak occurred in the Limpopo Department of Education or that it occurred at the Kauteng Department of Education. We're merely uh, trying to indicate the locality of the access. So the origin still needs to be determined. Uh, so we can 
confirm at this point that there are pockets of learners who are part of different social media groupings that have had access to the question paper in eight of the nine provinces. Uh, so that paints a different picture with regard uh, to the spread of uh, this particular leakage. Now, examinations have clear protocols in place in terms of how do you deal with the situation of, of this nature. And, and we are going with what we are referring to as a three-tiered approach. Uh, and tier one would be an investigation uh, conducted under the oversight of uh, the Director General. And we have a committee that is referred to as the National Examination Irregularities Committee, the NEIC. And the NEIC deals with all examination irregularities from a crib note to an imposter to a leaked uh, question paper. So under the banner of the NEIC, we have already put together an investigation team. And the investigation team will comprise of key role players in terms of the uh, NEC exam. And that would be <coughs> Umalusi, the South African Qualifications Authority, uh, University South Africa, USAF, and the Department of Basic Education. Um, this investigative team will constitute the first tier and I'll in a short while indicate to you what tier two and tier three will entail. Now in terms of tier one, the investigative team, they will have to complete their work by the, the 30th of November, not completing the work in totality, but the first phase of the investigation must be completed by the 30th of November and I'll explain to you why and the second phase will be completed by the 30th of January 2021. Now what will be the objectives of this investigative team? Firstly they have to establish the extent of the leakage. Now we cannot say that the leakage is national because national will imply every learner had access uh, to the question paper. But at the moment, it would appear, and again I say it would appear, that it is in pockets based on these groupings. And therefore, the task of this investigative team would be to establish the extent of the leak, because the extent of the leak will determine whether the rewrite is a national rewrite or it is a localized rewrite. Now we've had incidents in the past where we were able to confirm that the leakage was contained. Where there's containment, then the rewrite can be administered within the confines of that particular area. So that would be the first objective. And that has to be completed by the 30th of November so that if a rewrite is necessary, it can be done by the 15th of December uh, so that in the exam period, learners will be given an opportunity to, to rewrite. The second objective of this investigative team would be to make a recommendation that would ensure the credibility of the examination. I mentioned at the outset that the leakage of one question paper doesn't compromise the examination as a whole. And, and the responsibility of this investigative team would be to make a recommendation uh, to the DG, to the minister, on how we can, without a shadow of doubt, still ensure that the examination as a whole was not compromised. Thirdly, it would be to establish the source of the leak. We want to get to the origin. And, and I think Minister has already mentioned that uh, hard or harsh action will be taken against the culprits. Um, and finally, the objective of this investigative team 
Bullet number four is to make recommendations for the improvement of the examination system to avoid a recurrence of a leakage of this nature. And finally, the report coming out of these four objectives would be presented to the minister and to the Umalusi. Now, just to remind you that Umalusi is the Quality Assurance Council and uh, Umalusi will have to make the final determination that despite the leakage, that the examination has not been compromised as a whole, that the mechanisms, that the alternatives that uh, the department has put in has reinstated the credibility, particularly of, of, of the maths paper. So that was tier one. Tier two, uh, we have already engaged the services of the Directorate for Priority Crime Intervention, the Hawks, to assist us. And, and they have all the expertise to get to the source of the leak in, in the shortest time possible. And uh, both Minister and uh, our Director General will be uh, intervening to make sure that we get the best brains in, in, in the Hawks to be able to assist us uh, with getting to the source. And, and the third tier, the third tier is going to be more long term. And we're saying that given the nature and complexity of, of this investigation, there's a need to get together a team of experts, forensic experts, audit experts, and to do a full audit of the entire examination uh, cycle from inception uh, to the end, looking at the entire value chain across all nine provinces, across the DBE, to get to where exactly are the weaknesses because a chain is as strong as its weakest link. So we need to do that so that we do not have a recurrence of, of this nature. The investigative modality of the uh, task team uh, interviews will be conducted. We can't interview every learner that would have appeared on a, a WhatsApp group chat or would have had access to the paper in some way, but we'll do sample interview of, of learners and, and where possible parents will also be interviewed. Um, we are going to solicit the expertise of an IT forensic company who would help us in terms of tracing uh, the origin of, of the WhatsApp. Uh, we'll do an audit of selected exam site because remember the, the question paper appeared on uh, WhatsApp, but it would have originated from a storage point or a distribution point. So we'll be doing an audit of some of our centers where we may have suspicion that it could have originated from. Step number two, besides these investigative mechanisms, we also do what is referred to as an investigative audit of marking. While the marking is in progress, we have uh, highly trained uh, investigative auditors who will then look at scripts and from the pattern of responses that, em that emerge in terms of learner responses, they will be able to indicate whether such a learner may have had access uh, to a, a question paper. So we'll, we'll do that as well. Um, and then the third component in terms of the task team investigation will be to do a statistical comparative analysis. So if there are learners that get through uh, and, and not picked up, but through the statistical analysis where because you have a paper one and paper two, there should be some correlation, despite the fact that paper two may be more difficult given the nature of paper two, but you could do some kind of comparison and pick up anomalous performances uh, in, in, in paper, uh, paper two, because that's where the problem lies. We'll also do a statistical comparative analysis of our preparatory examination results with the final result to pick up possibly groups in terms of schools where the performance may be extremely high. So those are the mechanisms that we would be utilizing over the next two weeks and, and possibly a little bit longer. Um, what are the options that will be pursued 
uh, in terms of taking this matter to its logical conclusion that would reinstate the credibility in terms of the maths examination. We are going to be appealing to candidates that receive the question paper to provide their details uh, to school principals. Obviously, we will guarantee that they would be protected. And let me tell you that the vast majority of our learners were honest enough to get to their principals and say, I received this, and, and it was done in the morning before the examination. There's obviously a handful of learners who ran for support and, and did not bring it to the attention of the principal. So we think through this appeal, we'll be able to then get a sense of how many learners had access uh, via these social media platforms. We're also going to appeal to exam officials uh, and educators with any information to, to come forward and their anonymity would be, be guaranteed. Uh, so we're hoping that through these mechanisms of investigation, through the appeals, that we will finally be able to get to the source. Our DG has already uh, agreed to issue a stern warning. And, and I think we will not spare the penalty in terms of the culprits in this matter. Uh, because if one gets a sense of the psychological trauma uh, that is now being brought to bear on our learners, then one needs to uh, agree that we need to take serious action against the culprits. So in, in a nutshell, uh, if there's a need for a, a rewrite based on the evidence, and, and we don't want to preempt, it's purely dependent on what comes out of the investigation, whether there will be a rewrite and what the nature of, of the rewrite will be. Now, we are only one third through the exams. As Minister has mentioned, we still have two thirds. And uh, yesterday already, we had an intensive session with all our provincial heads of exam. And we now are looking at where are the areas that there may be some element of, of weakness. So we're tightening up uh, and, and we are improving security in every area. Uh, we are making sure that we have CCTV footage and that is kept safe so that nobody uh, you know, disappears with valuable evidence where breaches occur. Management and close supervision of contract workers. Unfortunately, given the magnitude of this examination, uh, you need to use contract workers. But contract workers uh, sometimes become difficult to manage and therefore there's a need for closer supervision of contract workers. You know, in all our points where question papers and possibly we, we're revealing a bit of a secret here, we have a double locking system. So no one individual can access a strong room uh, where question papers are stored. And, and that we're saying will be monitored closely across the system. We are doubling up on our monitoring, uh, not just of the writing, but throughout the process of wherever question papers are stored, distributed writing, uh, we are going to be doubling up. So, so that, uh, Minister, uh, is the report from our side. But let me just indicate that our examination officials, and we can assure the nation of this, are now more determined to ensure that the remaining subjects in the examination are, are well administered. And I am almost certain, with the support of the South African public, with the support of our media contingency, that we will get to the source and make sure that the rest of the examination goes without a, a glitch of this nature. Like I indicated, we are meeting regularly with our provincial heads more regularly than previously to keep ourselves updated on what is happening at the provincial level, the district level, the circuit level, even at the school, so that we're all up to speed and are on the same page. And uh, I think finally, I want to once again request to the South African public to alert the authorities if there is a slightest element of doubt in any examination process. If we want to ensure credibility, they can't even be 
a lingering doubt in the management of examination. So thank you very much, and, and I hope that we've addressed the concerns in this presentation. Thank you, Minister. Thank you, Juju. Thank you so much, uh, Minister. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Polia, um, for the detailed presentation. I'm laughing because I'm saying Matlago has already raised her hand, although I have not invited any questions in the room. Um, do we have any questions in the WhatsApp line first? Okay, great stuff. So it gives us an opportunity to come back here. I'm seeing through. Okay, Matlago, I can see you. Um, okay, two, three. Okay, three hands. Okay, I'll start up there. Matlago? Thank you for that. Uh, please introduce yourself. Um, Minister, um, Pastor Ethan Mensele. Um, just looking, we had a time frame on the 30th of November for the investigation. Um, so you assess whether there will be a new light. I assume a new light causes an early change that um, the ministry, the city limit has already gone to first quarters and the city I added. So those limits obviously have been caused a full month in the new light. Um, is there a possibility that we might exceed the time frame of 15th December, given that we had to remove limits and in compliance with the security of the four months? All right. That, maybe. All right, that's fine. Sisami? I'm seeing another hand. Go ahead. Went to, to where the, 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 the cooking papers are kept and they also 
So what you were saying, maybe no matter I'm using, is that uh, you want us, you, you want me to assure us that uh, the punishment is not headed towards the learners, but the people who are responsible for uh, the lifting of them on the stage. <laughs> All right, thank you for that comment. Um, Minister, I'm going to hand over to you to, to respond. Um, yeah, where's my sanitizer? She, she just took a day off with that permission. <laughs> <laughs> now the first question is it's easier to say minus because there are nine provinces you said eight so the only one that where we did get the report is free state so then the other eight will be the rest and when we spoke in the morning with the let me remove this mask I'm sorry when we spoke in the morning with the MECs, the MEC for Free State says they have not received the report. They are not ruling out that there will have been no child in the Free State who is in that WhatsApp group where most of the learners that had access to the paper were part of. So it's a Free State only which didn't report or where we didn't get the report that they were learners. So they were, yeah, so it's the Free State and that the security system in place that the cancer is in the department. I think partly one of your colleagues would have answered because we don't know the source, it could be the printers. Mm -hmm. uh, so we don't know the source. Until we know the source, we're not going to be able to say where is the cancer? Is it on the breast, on the throat or anywhere else? And that's what we're looking for. And that's what the investigation is all about. In some instances, the, I mean, the cancer had been diagnosed from different sources in the last incidents. Sometimes even at schools, because uh, you remember the Limpopo one, it was in the private school at a private center, that principal. So that's where the source was. It was in the private school. Because in the past, we used to, uh, now it's only the Western Cape where they lock papers overnight. So in the morning, from our system, papers are only delivered to schools in the morning. So in the past when we would have given schools papers overnight, the leak, the last leak that we had in the Bobo was at the school. When we had the leak in Pumalang, the source came from an official, right? So we, we, we still have to find out how it leaked. MEC Sufi said one of the learners who came to them said he got it from a friend who works at the printer. So we're not sure, we still have to investigate. So. There's no confirmation about where the leak is. In terms of rewrite, honestly, that would be the most desperate, the last option. We will only do a rewrite if we feel the integrity of the exam is, is in jeopardy because we also can't compromise the integrity of the exams. As much as possible, we'd want to protect, and that's why I don't even want to sensationalize, we want to protect all other learners were not part of this WhatsApp group. Uh, we are not sure how many people they've shared with. We were also looking at the time because Elijah got the information midnight, so it could have been the person who had access to the paper, had the paper overnight, we don't you know. Uh, so others said they got it at seven in the morning. With the forensic, we have to also have a sense of whether a maths paper at 7 a.m does it have any material impact on their knowledge? So the forensic marking will tell us whether there was any material impact in relation to time, if we're able to determine at what time the leak happened. Did it happen that time? Did it happen overnight? And those are some of the things that are going to help guide us as to how much the exam was compromised and as much as possible, because other learners were not part of it. I've been phoning even parents saying, 
are children going to have to rewrite for a sin they didn't commit or they were not part of? So we have to make sure that we protect also the majority of learners that were not there. So the rewrite really will be when we feel there is no option, the exam has been seriously compromised and and we need evidence to get to that. So as I said to be the last option, I'm not saying it's not going to be there. Then how is it possible to have the leaky at this time and age? Uh, that's what saddens us. Uh, because we invest a lot, a lot into protecting the papers and we thought we had gotten it right. Uh, I think that saddens up. Dr. Polo can go through the whole stages about how we protect the papers up to the last minute. And I do hope that the leak happened at the time when these learners were phoning this student at university to say, we are working on a paper, we've just received a paper, please help us with the following problems. So it could bring us closer to say, how do we have a leak uh, in these modern times? But I can assure you that we put almost every safety measure, a measure in place. That's why we're saying we're, we have to get another forensic auditing team to come and check again after having done all what we did how come we still had a leak because ourselves are as I say, are baffled disappointed and also embarrassed uh, how we deal with people whether learner or we are whether complainant the paper has been stolen from us so whoever did it's not us they are laws in place to say if you happen so we're not going to be the judges ourselves as the complainant so if it's an adult the hogs are here they're going to it's a criminal act they're going to deal with it according in terms of the laws if there is a learner we have clear they sign even you know as courses they sign before they sit for exams how they are going to to, to, to conduct themselves if they were, if they are found to have been complicit, it's no longer in our hands. They are going to be dealt with by the law. We are the complaining that our people, our learners who had signed the code of conduct, committed themselves to the following, did the following. So if they're the ones who, uh, I don't know, broke in overnight, I don't know how that leak happened, got the paper, put it on the WhatsApp, it's no longer in my hands. It's in the hands of the justice system. So they're going to deal with us. So we're invo involving the, the hawks now because it's now a criminal matter. It's, not, it's no longer an education matter where we can discuss and say who is, uh, who's the learner, who's the adult, who is who corrupted. Who. It, it now becomes a legal issue which has to be dealt by the law enforcement agents. And that's why hawks are involved at this stage because it has become a criminal act. So I'm not sure if maybe Dr. Pollock, because the question is, at this age in time, how do we have leaks? And especially in this dangerous age in time where there's also WhatsApp groups, which is even more difficult to manage. Good afternoon, colleagues. Thank you, Minister. I think the Minister uh, covered most uh, questions and comments which were made. Um, just to say that uh, I think Dr. Polia uh, fully represented uh, uh, how we feel about uh, this development. We are extremely disappointed given the work that we have put into preparing for this uh, uh, administration of the National Senior Certificate and the Senior Certificate. Well, with all the advancement of technology, we, we also know that uh, I like using the aviation industry because I marvel at the way the aviation industry is running its business. But we also know that uh, planes uh, do crash and in most instances, it's, it's because of human error. And, and that's why I said to the team, we can do 
all the best things in the world, but one element that you don't have full control over is the human element. You can persuade people to be honest, uh, to do things in the right way, but uh, at the end of the day, it would be up to them to live to that expectation of honesty. The same applies to learners, as the minister said. The whole country, we got learners signing a pledge. Uh, it's become you know, part of uh, preparing for exams in getting all learners to sign a pledge. But at the end of the day, it is their conscience uh, that would help to guide them every step of the way until we are done with the administration of the exams. The impact of the taxi strike, I think, will only get to know about that. The Gauteng officials should be busy assessing the impact of the strike. And I think uh, probably before the end of today, we'll get a sense of uh, what the impact has been in terms of the administration of the exam uh, today. Um, I think, Minister, those are the only two that I thought uh, Dr. Polia could come and uh, add uh, to the responses. Thank you. Thank you, Minister and DG. I'll, I'll just uh, provide some of the detail because I think DG and Minister have covered uh, most of the question. You know, just to give you uh, some kind of a glimpse of what this process entails, I think DG and Minister, we're possibly one of the few countries in the world that delivers question papers to school daily, uh, on a daily basis. Question papers are delivered to school. And in order to deliver question papers to school on a daily basis, you have officials that will have to get up in provinces like KZN, will have to get up as early as 3 o'clock in the morning to get to the district offices by 5, 6 o'clock. And then these distribution vehicles are on the road to make sure that the question paper gets to the school by latest at, at 8 o'clock. So we limit the distribution chain and depending on the profile of the province we have question papers stored at different points now the leakage could occur wherever and uh, i think dg has also alluded to the fact that we've automated a large number of our printing processes our pr uh, our packing process to minimize physical contact uh, with question papers. But despite all of that, if somebody has an intention, uh, you know, to jippo the system, uh, he or she will be able uh, to do that. And uh, our storage points um, are audited. Each one of them is audited. And you can only store question papers at a storage point if it satisfies our, our criteria. If it does not satisfy the criteria, you cannot store question papers. So that is the length and, and the depth to which we go through in terms of ensuring that question papers are in the hands of safe individuals and in safe premises. All our exam officials are vetted. So in essence we've done everything that is humanly possible to make sure in this modern age to ensure that the question paper doesn't leak but let me also just say that even in our first world countries that have the best system they have leakage of question papers so like our dg says it's about the integrity and the dependability on the human individual and and we all know that you know it's just one moment that you just do not apply your mind correctly and and that's when this compromise uh, takes place but we believe that 
every problem is just taking our processes to the next level, to the next step. So we will make sure that we improve on each of the possibilities or possible areas where the leakage would have taken place. Um, in terms of would this be beyond the 15th of December, um, I think we will do our best to make sure that our learners do not have to be extended in terms of their anxieties beyond the 15th of December. And uh, our minister will make an announcement uh, pretty soon after the 30th of November when that part of the investigation is completed and we'll do the best to accommodate our learners within that period. And uh, there would be no uh, situation where results will not be released. Uh, and fortunately, Minister, this year we've got right up to the 22nd of February. So we've got enough time to deal with whatever Uma Lucy may require of us to do so that we will still make sure that come the 23rd of February, learner results are, are received. I think our learners have had too much to contend with to be able to be punished further. Now, I, I think the point raised by Kosa is that it would appear as if our focus is on learners. Our focus is on learners at the moment, simply because we want to protect the interest of learners and make sure that the best interest of learners are served despite the fact that a group of learners uh, have had access to the paper. But finally, I mean, the culprits are adults and, and we will deal with the adults accordingly. But also you will agree with me that if a learner has had access to a paper, he cannot then go and write an exam and we then give him a mark based on him having had prior access to the paper. I mean, that I think we all agree on. And therefore, we want to make sure that the mark that the learner finally gets in mathematics is based on his own unaided performance. Now, the one slight advantage, Minister, is the fact that it would appear from the reports at the moment that the paper leaked Sunday afternoon, Sunday night, and the activity seems to have started for some reason or the other around you know, midnight. So that indicates that whoever had access to the paper would have had limited time. And, and in a number of cases, Minister, learners uh, at seven o'clock in the morning when they were going to school uh, picked up the whatsapp i mean the one girl it was while she was in the taxi yes was in the taxi when she picked this up and and let me indicate that a number of our learners went and took this to the principal so they did not have access uh, they may have looked at it but not gone further and went directly to the school principal and said principal I don't want to be implicated and therefore I'm bringing this uh, to your attention but it's going to be a tedious task to identify every learner that had access and what was the degree of access and therefore I say the investigative team has their work cut out together with the experts that we're going to pull in we'll certainly do our best there's going to be little sleep but we will make sure that we meet the deadline of the 30th of November and do not go beyond uh, the 15th of December in terms of uh, this particular process. Thank you, DG. Thank you. <coughs> thank you, Minister. Thank you, DG and uh, Dr. Polia. Can we do the last round? I'm seeing the same hands again. Um, I assume that after that we'll close because we are also running out of time. Heidi, back to you. additional plans to protect learners and at what additional cost would that come? 
right, thanks, Heidi. Masago? Thank you for that. I um, think we'll give it a second attempt. Uh, <laughs> Okay, that's fine. No more hands. Um, okay, great. Uh, this one is not needed. <laughs> we, we'll talk outside, Chief. Uh, you know how you and I do it. Thank you. The COVID-19 invigilation, I mean, lots of South Africans were very gracious about it, amazingly so. Most teachers volunteered. The health department came to the fore. There were individuals who were saying, guide us, train us, we want to do it. So we just had lots of support that we got. I even got the call, Dr. Polo, from the Wuhan group the team that had gone to retrieve, uh, to, to go and get uh, uh, South Africans from Wuhan, they said they are ready, they are anywhere, they can fly to wherever. And we didn't need so much support because uh, the numbers were very limited. And as I say, the, 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 the support was great. In most instances, in all instances, the teachers volunteered themselves. That's why we really didn't even need people from outside. So we worked with the health department because up front, the health department also uh, gave us people to assist. It's only one province where, is it, where, what's the game? Where the health department, two, two, two out of nine, where we didn't work with the Department of Health directly. But uh, in all the other provinces, uh, as I say, we, 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 we had volunteers and we had preferred teachers because we didn't have to train them on what to do, what systems. So when the teachers volunteered, it was much more easier for us to work with them and get the Department of Health to train them, to give them the right year to support them. So it was really not a, 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 a major issue. So even in terms of cost, because there were volunteers, uh, we have our officials also that we, we normally use. So the 80,000 volunteers would have been helpful because fortunately, it's not all learners who write the same exam all the time so we would have also used our officials to do the invigilation so i'm not sure about the costing but as i say it was not a major problem in terms of concessions i don't think we've reached that point where we, reach, we think it's a, it's a crisis point as dr polio was explaining where there were incidents of protests in committees learners were relocated there was no loss of time so i i don't think we've reached a stage where we could really think that uh, the right of learners was compromised because there were security problems. The provinces were also very helpful in the sense that they always had plan B, even today with Gauteng, because the strike, the church strike had been announced in advance, so they had already put in place contingency measures on how to deal with the situation. Even then, I don't think we had had a, a big problem. <clears throat> on the question of the extent of the extent of the leak, we still have isolated. Really, I, I already be speculating. We still have isolated cases, so I don't want to say it's only those individuals that we have we have come forward. We're mainly part of a, a particular WhatsApp group of grade twelves. 
So that's the information that we have up to now. So we're still, and that's why this investigation that has to finish on the 30th has to help us ident identify the extent of the, of the problem. Even this morning, some of the MECs were not even aware that there were problems that were picked up in the province because the problem was picked up in a particular WhatsApp group. But I don't want to underestimate it and say it's not wide. But up to now, we just have isolated cases in specific schools. Uh, yeah. Uh, and learners who brought, uh, uh, who came forward. And as I, as I say, the concrete one that we have now is that it is a group of grade 12s who are working together and supporting each other on a WhatsApp group that might, but we don't know who, maybe they gave their other friends a, a, at school. So the investigation is going to tell us about the depth, which is going to determine whether we really feel the, the paper was highly compromised, therefore it has to be rewritten, or we say it's confined to those learners. There are trends also about the, 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 the types of schools, but we still don't want to speculate too much and, and really uh, spread false rumors. In terms of the number of infected learners, uh, uh, Chair, the 93 of the 12, it's easier to measure because it was when almost all 90% of the learners were writing. So it gives us a much more accurate figure than when we have uh, exams written when they're doing CAT, maybe it's two learners. On the day they're doing Zulu, maybe it's, it's five learners. So it's easier to measure when you have all of them around the same time. So your first exam of English, first language, English additional language, you have 90% of your learners. So you, you have some accurate sense. When they write maths and maths lead, almost all the learners are writing. So you're able to have a, a, a better sense. So we will say 93 would have been the highest number. So that's why we're putting 93 as a figure because that, that would have been the highest number. But on other days, they could, could have had to deal with five, two, the days where no child presented with high temp temperature or some of these uh, learners who are in your isolation centers are not writing. So it's difficult to, to, to really give a figure on other days except for when there is a, a mass paper. Uh, like, And hence we're using the 12. No, no. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, thank you very much, Minister. Uh, colleagues, the issue of the 93, again, must be seen uh, within the context of uh, a number of variables. One is that uh, from the Ministerial Advisory Committee on the Coronavirus, uh, areas that started to uh, experience some increase in the infections, Eastern Cape is one of them, Free State is one of them, Lijeli Putsua and uh, Mangau are one of those, um, and, and Western Cape. So, uh, but also as the Minister said, is uh, within the context of the increasing uh, infections in communities because these learners come from communities where infections are happening and when we spoke to health experts they were not surprised they said these are the hot spots in the country because that's where these learners are coming from but as the minister and dr polia said the good thing is the working together between us and the department of health this is a health crisis not an education crisis we are caught up in a health crisis and the leadership of health becomes very crucial there is regular interaction between myself and the DG of Health. Also bringing on board, we said out of nine provinces, seven provinces seems to be giving us maximum cooperation. We've been working with the DG of Health to bring the other two provinces on board and to continue to manage this uh, as best as we can. Uh, concessions and marking process, the minister addressed that, but usually what happens, as Dr. Puglia uh, tried to explain in the most uh, eloquent manner in my own observation earlier on, is that once we are done with the administration of the exam, before the results are released, the minister considers a comprehensive report that we take to Umalusi for presentation. 
on all irregularities, including irregularities of this nature. What becomes crucial then is to present evidence of the scope of the irregularity, the impact of the irregularity in terms of uh, compromising the integrity of the exams. And that gets examined then by professors who've got an average of experience of between 30 and 50 years between themselves from universities who've been, who've been part of uh, the standardization of the exams, evaluating on how the administration of the exams uh, has gone and so on. And they will then apply their minds. And after that, that's what Dr. Polia said, Umalusi will then make a final determination as to whether the integrity of the exams uh, has been compromised or not. And our job is to make sure that we leave no stone unturned to collect every little evidence that we can have to determine the scope and the extent to which uh, the integrity of the exams would have been compromised. The issue of the cost, we do have uh, private invigilators. A very positive coincidence is to be running the May-June exams together with the November-December exams because your private candidates in the main would be subjected to an invigilation by uh, private invigilators. So we have them who would, at any rate would have been engaged and in many instances we didn't have to struggle where teachers indicated their unwillingness or because of fear or uh, anxiety and so on, understandably so, would say that, look, I'm not ready to invigilate. Then we'll bring in the uh, private invigilators with full knowledge of, uh, you know, the kind of situation that they will be expected to carry out uh, this exercise in. It's in our protocol as well. Um, yeah, thank you. I don't know. Thank you. I'm also just coming back to say thank you to everyone. Um, we appreciate the effort made to get here and the attention given and the questions asked. They will help us to, to sharpen the system as we go forward. Thank you so much. We really appreciate it.